This third Sunday of Advent, or for those that are into the Latin language, it's also called Godete Sunday. Nope. No. No. <laughs> Godete is the, the first line of rejoice in the Psalms. That's why we call it Godete Sunday. Okay, I'm, I'm off the hook from, from the doctor. <laughs> ah, because we're celebrating everlasting joy. That's why we have the pink candle amongst the blue candles, or it used to be purple candles. We celebrate everlasting joy. And converse, conversely, uh, there are many people that focus on, that rely on, that celebrate that finite, fleeting, worldly joy. Now the finite joy of this passing world and passing age, it always fades. It's more akin to a momentary happiness or, or an excitement bubbling up within us. And worldly joy, when the trials and tribulations of this age come upon us, oftentimes, well, actually most of the time, um, there's a loss of hope that happens within us and a loss of hope in the long term. I've heard many people say that there's just no joy in life anymore. There's no sense. Oftentimes when people are, are sick, that happens. But people who with repentance focus and rely on everlasting joy deal with the trials and tribulations of this age that yes have fleeting sorrows but they commune with the gift of eternal joy dwelling within their souls which brings them hope and brings them eternal comfort a comfort that this age isn't able to provide so in that sense Finite joy is a, a thing. Finite joy is created, an experience that fades away, where everlasting joy is the reality of God's presence with us, within us permanently, if we so choose. This being the case, the faithful church struggles in watchfulness, in repentance, in shunning worldly passions, seeking the fruit of the Holy Spirit, the greatest being selfless love, that by the mercy of God, the permanent reality will be proclaimed on the last day. Well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of the Lord. Finite worldly joy can be shared, yes, that's true, and everlasting joy can be shared as well. We're capable of sharing in each other's finite joy, and we get finite joy from our friends and our families. But again, this worldly joy is more of a sensation that kind of fades with time and isn't eternally life-changing. Everlasting joy is the reality of God with us, and that's shareable, that's spreadable in eternal life changing ways. When sharing everlasting joy in the common bond of love for God and others, the joy of the kingdom of heaven dispels hopelessness and thwarts the evil one and builds up the family of God regardless of the worldly struggles and torments that are faced. We all know folk that are indwelt by the eternal and everlasting joy of God. And what happens when they enter a room? Others are powerfully drawn to the faith and the presence of Christ Jesus within them. Yes, finite joy is exciting and infectious, but it's temporary and certainly not life-changing, at least not in an eternal manner. Whereas the everlasting joy of the Holy Spirit, the repentant, faithful church, 
commune with joy in ceaseless prayer and can completely change one's own life or help to change eternally the life of another. Well, with this being the truth, the church by continuous prayer and repentance with everlasting joy this Advent season and beyond are becoming everlasting joy by God's grace. We don't become God by nature. We become God's everlasting joy by grace. And all the while we remain our own unique self as created in God's image and likeness. And this everlasting joy is also with the angels and the church invisible. That's those that have gone before us and celebrating eternal joy celebrates with the angels and the church invisible for there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance eternal joy celebrates your repentance and mine joy can't be a thing an it so the faithful have a life-giving call to encourage everyone, to encourage each other in the church and everyone outside of the walls of this place into righteous living. For one person to repent brings rejoicing on earth as it is in heaven. Well, Worldly joy can be fairly quick to take a hold of if we want to, but that eternal joy, it's often the evil one and the worldly temptations that try to stifle that everlasting joy in the faithful person. Because the evil one can't understand, can't comprehend how that eternal joy would remain in a humble repentant person so therefore he's jealous he envies us he sets traps for us that might be might bring us to hopelessness might bring us to be grieved even about our faith grieved even about god and then we fall so the response to that is to take up one's cross, remembering that joy is fruit of the Holy Spirit, but also is long suffering. St. Paul reminds the church, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God all will have moments of suffering but god's everlasting joy is this reality as jesus says himself most assuredly i say to you that you will weep and lament but the world will rejoice and you will be sorrowful but your sorrow will become joy meaning eternal joy can change the very soul of a person if they're willing to humble themselves and repent and this is the one foundation for that indestructible everlasting joy in this age and in the age to come created finite joy is different than the indestructible everlasting joy for it rests on a finite foundation, a created foundation. Worldly joy depends on circumstances which are always changing. Finite joy comes and goes. Finite joy is unstable, fleeting, and fades. However, the faithful church understand that one can be eternally joyful in the worst circumstances. For God's everlasting joy isn't based on time-based things or events or emotions. 
but on the reality of the eternal presence of God within us, within the faithful church. Eternal joy is of God. And the way we commune in the fullness of this joy is to humble ourselves, repent, and receive him, for he is eternal joy within us. St. Peter says, Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, whom having not, whom you not having seen, though now you do not see him, yet believing you rejoice with joy and full of glory. So joy is an uncreated energy of God, like God's grace is. Grace of God is the very presence of God within the soul. It's, as St. Peter says, the sharing of God's divine nature with us without us becoming God. Instead, we become like God. The message of the Advent season then is his arrival is near. The arrival of eternal joy is near, whether that happens in the manger at Bethlehem or in the clouds in glory at his second advent. And at the Feast of the Nativity, we'll hear that echoing refrain of the angelic host saying, I bring you tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For today in the city of David, a savior is born to you. He is Christ the Lord. Again, joy, everlasting joy, not for some, but for all. Brought to us by God who loves us so much that he came to dwell with us in human flesh. And in his incarnate birth, life, passion, death, resurrection, and ascension. Christ Jesus being fully God and fully human has lifted human nature up into the heavens and has made humanity one with him. Therefore, as one old saint used to say, joy is to dance to the music of his heart. In the church's pastoral experience and in my experience as well, the cause of sorrow and misery is being far from God by persistently chasing worldly joy. This turning away from God causes an aching within the human soul for God's everlasting joy. Again, everlasting joy isn't the absence of sorrows, but the presence of God in all situations in this age. Because our notion moves from the truth over to a delusion that is so easy for us to fall into, that we're alone, we're alone in the midst of our pains. And that's the source of our greatest sorrow. But turning to God, we realize that God is with us. And our sorrows are embraced by eternal joy. When we're turned from God, even our greatest earthly and finite joy doesn't embrace as the everlasting arms of Christ do. My dear mother of blessed memory, sadly my mother died on the 28th of September of this year, just five days after her birthday. She loved, uh, well, she hated this saint to begin with because she didn't like his name. His name is Saint Seraphim. But she uh, read a couple of books of him and, and uh, I'm sure she's loving him even as we speak. He says this, when the spirit of God descends on a person and envelops them in the fullness of his presence, the soul overflows with unspeakable eternal joy for the Holy Spirit fills all he touches with eternal joy. Jesus says, in the world you will be sorrowful, but when I see you again, your heart will rejoice, and your joy no one will take from you. Then this transitory and partial finite joy, which we now feel, will end at his second advent, 
an eternal, everlasting joy will overwhelm our souls and our bodies with ineffable delights, which no one will be able to take from us for all of eternity. Again, the way to overcome isolating ourselves from God and focusing and depending on the joy of this age, it continues, begins, begins, continue, ends with, broken record here, repentance, turning back to God. The first word that Christ Jesus spoke in his public preaching is repent. The last words to his apostles before his ascension, repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name to all nations. There's no joy, at least everlasting joy, without repentance. And there's not any true repentance that is not accompanied by everlasting joy. The human and divine union of repentance with eternal joy, we hear in the Psalm, Psalm of David, have mercy on me, O God, blot out my transgressions. I have done evil in your sight, created me a clean heart, O God, make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which you have broken may rejoice, restore to me the joy of your salvation, who is the presence of a person. Repentance is the restoration of that inexpressible, everlasting joy. There's no more useful path to the eternal presence of God's joy than sustained repentance throughout one's life. Joy is not the polar opposite of sorrow, but the transformation of sorrow from distancing ourselves from God and choosing not to love others as Christ has loved us. If true repentance is the path to joy, then humans that choose not to repent will seek again and again the passing worldly joy from a person, place, activity that will one day disappoint. We're all free to choose to embrace finite worldly joy over and over and over again. But remember, only everlasting joy returns the embrace eternally.